This desolate windswept corner of Canada is an unlikely location to have a place in history. Yet the lighthouse at Kip Race was to receive one of the first ever SOS calls at sea. It was here on April the 14th, 1912, that two Marconi radio operators were on duty, Jack Goodwin and Walter Gray. At around about 10.35 Eastern Standard Time, Goodwin took in a Morse message. He turned to Gray and he said, Good God, Gray, the Titanic struck an iceberg. It was here that the world first learnt of the tragedy. Somewhere out there, RMS Titanic was sinking. Hundreds of people would die in the dark, cold waters of the North Atlantic. The tragedy would remain the most intriguing maritime controversy of all. In the docks at St John's in Newfoundland sits the Keldish. This Russian ship sails the world all year round. But for a few weeks every summer, she has only one destination, Titanic. This summer, Irish diver Rory Golden joined the ship on a special mission. He's taking a plaque from Harland and Wolfe and the people of Belfast to lay on the bridge of Titanic. As a diver, Titanic would be known as the ultimate dive. It's the pinnacle of the depths of the ocean, if you like. Um, you ask any diver in the world, you ask anybody in the world probably, well, you know, what's, what's the world's most famous shipwreck? And people will 99% say Titanic. And yet they're having far greater tragedies at sea. They're having far, there's been far greater loss of life at sea since Titanic. But she was a turning point in many respects of the world. I joined Rory and the crew for the 10-day expedition to find out for myself why Titanic retains its fascination after all this time. As night falls, the ship slips away from the dock. Well, we're under way now and heading out into the Atlantic towards the Titanic. It's going to take us almost two days to get there, some 365 miles. That's how close the Titanic was to safety. Sergey. Sergey. Oh, Sergey. Yeah. Okay, Sergey. You understand. Uh, we... For Rory Golden, this trip to Titanic is loaded with importance. He's been entrusted with taking the first ever memento to Titanic from the shipyard that built her. I was here in the year 2000 and I placed a memorial plaque from Cove. So here we have myself returning to Titanic with memorials, plaques from the city of its birth, where Titanic was built. Placing plaques alongside a plaque that I placed from Titanic's last port of call. So to me, it's, it's quite symbolic and I think it's very significant. And I think it's particularly right that at this time, something from Belfast is finally in place on the bridge of that great ship. Sergei's handiwork will allow the robotic arm of our submarine to move the plaque into position on Titanic when we visit the wreck. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a good job. Very nice. Simple, do you understand? Yeah, yeah. During the voyage, there is a chance to meet some of my fellow travellers on board the Keldish. Artist Roger Banzimer paints scenes from Titanic. He's taking advantage of a second opportunity to visit the wreck. I'm not a Titanic fanatic. I don't know how many uh, rivets were in the hull. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a historian with the Titanic. Uh, I wasn't really interested that much in Titanic before I was invited out the first time. But once you see it with your own eyes, boy, there is just something very, very powerful about it. Pat Shepard is an avid explorer who's dived in over 100 wrecks. 
Titanic has a certain mystery to her due to her depth, and she has a romance to her because of her history and, and her size and her era, you know, the time of life that she came from. She has a beauty like no other beauty I've ever seen. Also on the ship, a father and son. American Mike Harris set up the expedition and has brought his own film crew along. He's taking his son, Sebastian, just 13, down to Titanic, setting a world record for the youngest person to dive to the wreck. And this is what will carry us down to the wreck site. The 18-ton Mir is a powerful mini-submarine which is capable of diving to the bottom of the ocean. Although it and its sister sub, Mir 2, make hundreds of deep dives all over the world each year, there are unique risks in the journey down to Titanic. If anything went wrong at that depth, you're dead. Therefore, the technology that these Russians have developed here is fantastic. And you have to trust the technology, because if you don't trust the technology, there's no point in being there. There's no point in getting into that capsule in the first place. Any trip to the Titanic can be your last trip. I think you're aware of that, but the Russians do an ex exemplary job of maintaining their equipment. You feel like you're in safe, good hands when you make the descent. For seven decades, there was grit debate about where Titanic lay. Today, the satellite equipment indicates the position down to the last few yards. This Russian chart tells its own terrible story. The ragged line shows how far south the ice drifts in the Atlantic. Below the line is safety. Titanic nearly made it. One challenge for the Russian submarine pilots is to find Titanic in the pitch black water. But they do have something to signpost the way. Now these are transponders and these are going to be lowered down to the seabed in a few minutes. There's four of them and the idea is that they go down to the seabed and then the subs use them for reference to find out where they are in relation to the wreck. To take them to the seabed is this huge piece of railway track. But even with that weight, to give you an idea how far they have to travel, it takes these an hour and a quarter to reach the bottom. The Mir submarines are getting their final safety checks. They'll soon be in one of the planet's most hostile environments. On top of them, the crushing weight of the Atlantic Ocean. As the diving starts, there's alarm as one of the submarine's outer hatches bursts open in the rough seas. For those about to dive, it's a little unnerving. I've seen 24 dives. That was the first time I've seen the hatch not together. So it was pretty, uh, pretty hairy there for a few minutes. Hopefully ours goes a little smoother. Are you worried? Yeah, of course, as anybody would be. It's like, uh, how often do you go to the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> not very often. Got my life insurance is paid up, so feeling good. Feeling good. It's dusk, ten and a half hours later. Dave's submarine is returning from the depths. I'm looking forward to getting the diver's reaction on a trip I'll be making myself tomorrow. What a great trip. What a great trip. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, that was great. Kind of hard to walk a little bit, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Roy. All right. Dave has only one regret, that he couldn't salvage from the wreck. It was hard being down there without pulling anything up. <laughs> Mike Harris has a similar view about souvenir hunting when he arrives back with his son. You got it, Dave? 
got a little world record holder for a kid, huh? Welcome to kill it. <laughs> but you're right. Not salvaging is like spear fishing without a gun. Very miserable. <laughs> but the Russians don't believe in salvaging from the gravesite that is Titanic. They're deeply superstitious about the wreck. It shows in their attitude towards the seabirds that land on deck each night as the divers return. The Russians take great pains to make sure they're not harmed. <laughs> The reason? Superstition. The Russians believe the birds are the souls of those who died on Titanic. The morning of our dive has arrived. In our fireproof suits, we pose for the cameras and then it's down to business. The mirror is tiny, packed with instrumentation and equipment. It's a cramped space just six feet across. But well, we're in the mirror now. It's coming up to 11 o'clock. And we've been lifted out from the side of the ship. Yeah, we're just about to be put in the water. And it feels good. It really does. It's very exciting, but I'm ready. It would be almost 10 hours before we would see the surface again. We're on our way to the bottom of the ocean. Our pilot Anatoly has talked back to the ship above us. Every move we make is tracked in the control room of the Keldish. Well, Anatoly, I consider this to be a great privilege to be with the chief scientist. Because, um, no problem for me. I don't think it's going to be uh, a repeat for me again. No. I think this is very special. The question is, does Anatoly think it's a great privilege to be with us? <laughs> oh, look. Ah, there's a bit of life. Well, it's now pitch black outside, not surprising, because we're at 2,000 metres, that's 6,000 feet. We've got uh, just about 1,500 metres to go. The temperature's dropping rapidly. We're going to have to start putting warm clothing on just to really stay warm, because over a period of time, you can get so cold, I'm told, inside one of these. But there's no sensation of falling, no sensation of movement. If it wasn't for the navigation panel up here, just to, uh, to my right, we wouldn't really know, in a sense, where we, what, where we are. Just looking at it, we're slowly heading up parallel to the bow of the Titanic. And as we get closer, um, Anatoly, uh, the captain, will start to bring us in tight on the ship. But it really is just a case of sitting back and waiting. Thirty meters to the bottom. Thirty meters to the bottom. Okay. Okay. Well, we are now just about thirty meters or so from the bottom, and once we establish where the bottom is, we're going to track off to find the Titanic. We should come up somewhere near the bar. Outside on the seabed, there's yeah, nothing to suggest what is just out of range of our lights. Wow, oh, Anatoly, this is amazing navigation. <laughs> You're going to bring us right to the bow, aren't you?
And sure enough, he does. There she was, the bow of Titanic. Titanic's huge anchor chain still lies on her deck. Forward hold provides a brief glimpse down into the ship. The foot of the huge mast at the front of the ship, it fell backwards when she sank. The small door from where the lookout crew saw the iceberg is still clearly visible. Then a reminder that others have been here before. We've arrived at the remains of the bridge where plaques from previous visits had been left. Well, we're now about to lay the plaques on the bridge. Quite a delicate manoeuvre. From Harland and Wolfe and the people of Belfast, in memory of all those who lost their lives, the message that we leave on Titanic. And standing guard over the plaques, Titanic's telemotor, the structure that once held the ship's wheel. Then we move on to explore the rest of the ship. The roof above the Marconi room where the Mayday calls were sent from is deteriorating. Any sign of life creeps across the ship. Our mirror is confronted with a huge gaping chasm. As we gaze down into Titanic's depths, we realize this is where the grand staircase once stood. This veil of rust is gradually overwhelming Titanic, slowly blinding her portholes. The mirror's lights reflect off the glass, still intact in many of the windows. It's remarkable that despite the terrible damage to the ship, so much of the glass has survived.
Titanic's collapsing structure reveals another detail. Ah, Captain Smith's. Very, very strong. Uh, Captain Smith's very... bath. The white enamel of the captain's bath. And this is the door through which first-class passengers would have boarded the ship. Outside our submarine are our glimpse of a curious rat-tailed fish. Titanic broke in two as she sank. Her stern lies hundreds of yards away. The sea between is littered with pieces of coal scattered from the ship's bunkers. Much of the back of the ship has collapsed into twisted metal, but parts of the huge engines are still recognizable. the ship is up. We've been filming Titanic for five hours and now it's time to return to the surface. It gives us a moment to contemplate on what we've seen and there's a lot to think about and to understand. Just to explain, we've now actually reached the surface in, in a very good time indeed and we're now waiting for the the boat and the diver to come and lift us, which means, of course, we're rolling around in the swell. It's night time. We've been underwater in the mere for almost 10 hours. Well, it's been an extraordinary journey in this extraordinary vessel. But the task has been completed. The plaque from Harland and Wolf and the people above Belfast now rest safely on the ship. It's also extraordinary to think it's the only thing ever to leave Harland and Wolf and join the ship since she sailed all those years ago. Bags of plastic cups attached to the outside of the mirror are retrieved. Crushed by the massive pressure, they've been reduced to perfect miniature souvenirs. One thing is painfully clear from our dive. Titanic is rusting away at a dramatic rate. For Rory, her deterioration has been shocking to witness. I saw it five years ago. The main mast is um, collapsing on itself. It's disintegrating literally in front of your eyes. A lot of the decks are falling in. The rusticles seem to be spreading everywhere. It's, she's, she's in a bad way. It's a sobering thought with which to leave Titanic. But there is consolation for Rory in the knowledge that he has reconnected the ship to Belfast. It completes a circle in some ways for me, in as much as when I did the plaque laying five years ago, I thought it would be appropriate and nice and right that a plaque from, from Belfast would go to the wreck someday. I just hope that people would see that peace in many ways for the ship has come in that respect. Once ashore in Canada, there was one more part to the journey before the return to Belfast. In a cemetery in Halifax, Nova Scotia, are the graves of 121 of the Titanic dead. Fairview Cemetery has attracted many tourists since the movie Titanic rekindled curiosity about the ship. Many stones mark unknown bodies with just a simple number showing the order in which they were found. Including this stone, marking the grave of William McQuillan from Belfast, 
who was a fireman in the Titanic's engine rooms. I didn't realize at the time I'd soon be back in the same cemetery on an extraordinary mission. Sitting watching the original screening of this program was Marjorie Wilson in Belfast. Grave 183. It belongs to William McQuillan of Seaview Street. When the gravestone of William McQuillan came on her screen, she was in for a shock. It was Victor, my husband, said, come on, quick. And I said, what is it? And he said, he mentioned W. McQuillan, Seaview Street. And I looked at him and I said, that's my granda. I says, what is it? He says, I've got a grave. So that was my excitement. I never knew. So then the next morning I went up to Mum and she, she was amazed too because all she knew was, and we, what the relatives knew was he was lost at sea. So some of your family actually went to their graves not realising that um, William was actually buried in Canada? That's correct. They've all passed away. Not one of them knew. William McQuillan wasn't even supposed to be on the Titanic. Asked by another man to do him a favour, William had fatefully swapped ships at the last minute. The Belfast Telegraph of the day had recorded the fact that William McQuillan, along with the rest of the men from Belfast, had been lost when the ship sank. In the days long before radio, television and the internet, his family accepted the news. But it's not the end of the story. We took Marjorie Wilson to the Titanic Cemetery in Nova Scotia. Mm. Well, Grandad, we found you. This is your granddaughter, Marjorie. We found you at last. Very emotional, excited and emotional. But uh, the thing excitement was actually to see in his name on the headstone. And it's just all emotion came out. I'm lucky I found my grandfather, but there's other people out there and don't actually know that these could be their relatives. Goodbye, Granda. And that's how I find myself walking with the granddaughter of a Titanic victim amongst these graves. Months earlier, neither of us could ever have imagined this extraordinary twist of fate. A twist that seems to be part of the Titanic legend. When we went down to Titanic, we took not one plaque from Harland and Wolfe, but two. One we laid on her bridge, the second we brought home with us. The plaque, now tarnished from her dive to the ship, is the only item ever to return from Titanic to her birthplace. You can go online to explore the timeline of the Titanic sinking and see some video clips used in this programme at bbc.co.uk slash Titanic.